Hello, students. This screencast will take us through finding meaning in poetry. So we're looking at other ways to analyze poetry. Poetry speaks to people in a different way. The sounds, metaphors, similes, images, and emotions allow a different connection within our brains, often creating meaning subconsciously. Learning how to unpack that meaning shapes our lives as learners and makes us more able to understand a multitude of communication styles. The TP cast is a method for reading a poem, gathering its literal meaning, then interpreting the text on another, more abstract level. This is a method that many high school honors and advanced placement courses use. So becoming familiar with it now will give you an opportunity to become adept at using it to analyze and interpret poetry. So there are different ways that we want to look at a poem. We look at the title, we try to paraphrase, we search for connotations, which we've already been over, we look at attitude and tone, we look for shifts, we revisit the title, and then we try to identify a theme. Whenever you're given a text, no matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction, look at the title. Examine the title of the text you're studying, and based solely on the title, predict what you think the piece is about. Pause this screencast as you make an entry in your writer's notebook and predict what you think the text, Where I'm From, is about. Whenever you're approaching a poem, you should listen to the poem being read aloud as you follow along two to three times. This is Where I'm From by George Ella Lyon. Allow yourself to hear the poem and its overall message. I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch. Black, glistening, it tastes like beets. I am from the Forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I'm from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I'm from the know-it-alls and the pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down. I'm from he restoreth my soul with a cotton ball lamb, and ten verses I can say myself. I'm from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee. From the finger my grandfather lost, to the auger, the eye my father sh shut to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box, spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. So, how close were you in your prediction about the title of Where I'm From? Since the title is straightforward, you probably were accurate. With Where I'm From as a title, I expect the poem to tell me more about where the author lived, who was there, what she did. That was probably something you may have written. However, other elements of the poem may have caught you off guard a bit. Look at the first two tasks. You're going to reread the poem, looking closely at diction. What are the specific or particular words in this poem that seem to be telling the reader something about the topic or about how the author feels about where she's from? Highlight these words or phrases. You're going to look for precise words specific to a region or type of lifestyle or words that build something within the poem. You can do this with any poem or song you encounter. Let's look at this. Your answers probably vary a bit, but there are some words that everyone should have. Many times if you see a proper noun or a word that's capitalized when it's not the beginning of a sentence, you know it's going to be pretty specific to this particular author. So just glance through the blue words and see how many you wrote down as well. Close your eyes and just listen to this paragraph. Happy to be able to make her favorite picnic drink, Michaela pulled the lemons out of the fruit basket and washed them. Then she cut the fragrant yellow fruit, smelling the fresh citrus scent of the mist that signaled summer for her. 
Lemonade was like a sunny day and a smile from a friend and a cool rain all at once. Lemons with little puckered jackets hiding their fresh tangy tartness. Now open your eyes. Did you notice anything? The majority of people who read this begin to feel their lips pucker and their mouths start to salivate. Words with imagery create reactions in our minds and our bodies. Imagery is a powerful tool that makes a connection between the text and the reader. Imagery uses the senses. Taste, touch, sight, smell, and sound. Details about our sense of motion and emotions can also be enhanced through the use of imagery in a piece of writing. Let's look at how imagery could work with each sense. So here we have taste. As you read through, you can probably start to taste the tea. Think of the ways that sound is used in writing without the reader being aware of it at times. Listen to both the words and listen for the sounds the writer placed in the text. Lightning flashed, the rain hit the roof in a slow staccato, then the windows rattled as the storm grew wilder, more intense. Sonia and her band heard nothing while practicing during the thunderstorm until Sonia's amp blew with a crashing clap and piercing buzz that left her ears ringing and sounds muffled for several days afterward. When we read a description, sometimes it is exactly what is seen. This text has a sight imagery, but it has so much more. It has a metaphor. The moon is a silver slipper. In addition, the text refers to a play called The Glass Menagerie, an allusion to a piece of literature. Smell can be more challenging to weave into writing, but if it's something a bit unusual, readers remember it more. Touch usually has to be described in a way that includes something the reader would be familiar with or have some knowledge about. Let's take a look at some common literary techniques you are likely to find in poetry. Some you've heard of and some may be new. Imagery we've discussed using figurative language to create visual images. Similes and metaphors comparing two seemingly different ideas. Personification giving human qualities to different objects. Onomatopoeias using words to create the actual sound like splash, buzz, or splat. Alliteration, repeating the use of consonant sounds at the beginning of words. Hyperbole, an exaggeration to emphasize an idea or action. And you can pause the screencast to read this cartoon. Puns are very common in comedy, but are also found in poetry and literature. That's when you use a word to suggest two or more of its meanings, or the meaning of another word similar in sound. You find them in a lot of jokes. For example, did you hear the joke about the high wall? It's hilarious. I'm still trying to get over it. <laughs> An allusion, on the other hand, is a reference in a literary work to a person, place, or thing in another piece of work or literature or music. Um, so if you see don't be a Scrooge in a piece of writing. That's an allusion to a Christmas carol. And you can read this blurb about allusions and the little cartoon as well. Allegories are a literary technique in a text which has characters and events in a literary, visual, or musical art form 
represent, or stand for an abstract idea or event. Much of the most popular entertainment that has longevity is written by individuals who have an extensive knowledge and a deep understanding of the literary techniques a writer can use. You might be surprised by how shows such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer had teams of writers who wanted the allegories to be part of the intrigue of the show. Irony is when you use the words to express something other than and especially opposite of the literal meaning. Now irony can be tricky to notice at times. Look at the Garfield cartoon. Notice the onomatopoeia used in words such as clot, splot, and chunk. See if you can figure out what the irony in the comic is. Did you decode it? What do you expect when feeding a pet? Put the food in the bowl and the animal eats. Would you expect a messy pile of uncanned cat food to be garnished or fancied up with something as silly as a little paper umbrella like you'd get with a fruity drink? That unexpected detail makes it ironic. At a point in the next week or so, you will have a quiz in which you have to use, recognize, and or explain the use of these techniques and devices in text. So make sure that you're practicing identifying them and defining them. Let's see how you can use some of the imagery devices. Time to practice. Pause this screencast while you write out the sentences above. So first you should write a paragraph that uses both smell and touch. And you can write it about anything. Then you should write a paragraph that combines taste, sight, and sound. Here's an example of a paragraph that used both smell and touch. Here's an example of a paragraph that combined taste, sight, and sound. Did you find this task more challenging since you had three senses to deal with? Do you find it easier to find the imagery or to write it into a paragraph? Why? Knowing how difficult it is to force fit imagery into writing, you may wonder why imagery is used so frequently. Imagery allows readers to connect and understand an experience that they may never have had or may never experience. Imagery can apply layer after layer of meaning to a passage. So sometimes you'll find imagery within other figurative language, such as metaphors. Other times you may find imagery in similes. It's also fairly common to find imagery in personification. For our next task of close reading, you're going to examine the poem for reading with a lens of imagery. You're going to highlight any examples of words or phrases that appeal to your senses. Remember that imagery is the use of figurative language to describe or present objects, ideas, and even actions in a way that the description appeals to our physical senses. Then explain each example you highlighted. Pause the screencast while you open the document, How to Analyze Where I'm From, Tasks 3 and 4. When you finish, save it and upload it before returning to this screencast. Did you have Clorox and carbon tetrachloride both highlighted? Let's look at the poem with an eye for imagery. 
Think of what you notice that is highlighted in this sample. Remember, you may have had a few that are different, and that's totally okay. Did you have some answers for imagery that you interpreted in a different way? Maybe you overlooked a few. With practice, you'll be able to uncover most examples of imagery. That's how analysis works. For your answer, you can provide evidence from the text that supports your idea. If you can, the answer is relevant. Look at these elements and devices. This is a list you can refer to during the next activity. Back to the poem. This close reading is reading the poem to find any elements not yet discussed. You're going to highlight any example of words or phrases that are examples of sound, onomatopoeia, connotation, similes, metaphors, repetition, etc. Use the list to help you if you need to do so. Explain each example you highlighted. Pause the screencast while you open the document, How to Analyze Where I'm From, Tasks 5 and 6. When you finish, save it and upload it before returning to this screencast. When you read the poem again, did you find even more? That's the purpose of close reading. You find elements you can easily overlook when you just skim a text, or let your eye move across it without taking time to find the treasures within the words and phrases. You have worked hard to examine diction, connotation, denotation, tone, and mood. Examining literary devices enable you to see the meanings beneath the literal meaning in George Ella Lyon's poem, Where I'm From. Interpreting the whole picture of what a text is about, combined with the underlying meanings of all these smaller pieces, allows you to analyze text. Analyzing text also helps you hone your critical thinking skills. You're a developing writer who is learning more about your craft through these activities.